Ja. Ja, all right. All right, so thank you all for coming. And it's, it's great to be back here in Rotslav. I was here last year, uh, and I loved it. And I was really happy when you guys invited me to come back and speak. So here we are. And um, today I'm going to talk about something I call results-only web investments. And the first time I held it was in, in Prague last year. Um, a bit about me. My name is Jacob. Some may know me as one of the guys behind Node 1 before Node 1 Sweden became WonderCrowd. Uh, I left Node 1 in September of 2012 to strike it out on my own, so to speak. Right now, I run a company called Leansept. And Leansept is a digital innovation agency. So we basically help, cu help customers and companies go from innovative strategic ideas to products and, and services through everything that you need to do, figuring out who you're going to sell to, how you're going to make money. It's a lot more focused on business than actually than building software. But we build software too, because I believe the merger of the two, that's why the fusion there, that's why you can do some really cool stuff. Um, and uh, we work with freelancers. So if this sounds something that you'd be interested in, just uh, drop me a line. Um, all right. So on to the subject at hand today, 16%. 16% is the number of web projects that are considered successful. And then you probably ask, what do I mean by successful? By successful, we mean projects that are done on time, done on budget, done to spec, and that have the desired effect for the organization. If it has to do with you know, generating leads, conversions, whatever. Whatever they expected to happen, whatever they thought would happen when they built this thing. And that's a pretty, that's a pretty low number. So if you do some comparisons, it would be like, all cars save one crash, for example. I can imagine that you buy a car, and after five years, that we get, you know, 6% chance. Um, a lot of sad pets. Seriously. Yeah, I see. I had to pull the sentimental one here. Sorry, guys. But you, you see, a lot, of, like, a lot of sad site owners out there. So I think the core of it lies in this. A wise man once said, Theodore Levitt, he was a marketing professor at Harvard, he said, nobody wants a fourth inch drill, what he wants a fourth inch hole. Imagine you go to the, you, you go to the store, the hardware store. Do you tell the sales clerk this? Um, let's go ahead a bit here. Do you tell them this? Hey, I want a drill, I want a rubber grip, 3,000 RPM electric motor, blah, 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 blah. No, I'm going to install a shelf in my bathroom. And they're like, okay, what are the walls made of? Okay, they're concrete, there's, there's tile, ceramic tile. Okay, you need this, this, and that. No one ever asks you, like, but this is, this is how we sell, this is how we sell websites, requirements. Like, up and down, home page, packages module, there's going to be a button there, color, they even specify the hex code, color code, some of these. And did it tell, I mean, did it tell us anything relevant? Like, who are we involved? What does the buyer expect? Why are they spending money and resources on this? No. Like uh, Gorko Atsic, a, a guru, I will quote about a bit from later. Delivery plans and requirements documents are often shopping lists for features without any context that explains why they are important. And same here. I don't care. Does it make a hole? That's all the customer wants to know. <clears throat> but they've been led into believing that this is what they need. Um, my I'm not going to start a war on requirements, even though I think the world is full of bad requirements here. What I'm going to talk about today is a way to focus on what matters. And that makes everyone happier. So we're going to talk a bit more why this is that way, how it can be different, and also deliver a method to get there. We need to emphasize investment and results, not cost and requirements. Um, and let's do a poll. Let's, let's think back like a few weeks or a few months to your last project. I'm going to ask some questions. And if you agree with them, you should raise your hand. All right, let's see how this works. <coughs> Did everyone involved understand what the intended business results of the project were? I mean, you, the customer? Not a single hand. Oh, one. OK. One, that, that was, it's not totally this one. All right. <coughs> um, I have my cheat sheets here, so. Um, 
was everyone, buyer and say a seller, able to communicate clearly and transparently about risks and problems that occurred? Like, could you tell someone, oh, this is not working, or we won't get this in time without getting a, the angry look? Not a single hand, okay. Wow. Did everyone feel that the project was something they could be proud of in terms of achievement, quality, and innovation? Like, could point it, like, I did that, I was part of that? Okay, good. <laughs> but you're doing Django these days, so. <laughs> <laughs> Did everyone involved understand the definition of a successful project and how success was measured? Like what did the customer hope to see after the site was done? Okay, same guy again. <laughs> All right, I won't talk to you later. Or you're going to have to tell me this case after the session here. In the end, oh, we'll see. In the end, did the customer get what they needed to address the actual business problem or opportunity? Did he get something to help them? Yeah, Christoph's like, sort of. <laughs> it's better than no. And, and this, is, this is not uncommon. Like this, this, is, this is the reality. This is why you have these 16%. I'm going to tell you a bit of a story from a, about a company called Widgetco. And Widgetco, they want to get an e-commerce. They have a website. They sell widgets, of course. And because um, they believe that many of the customers would prefer to buy their stuff online. Susan, she's the product manager. Um, and she's tasked with executing and running this project. And she thinks the main reason to a better website is, of course, to drive people to the e-commerce section to buy stuff from them. She also wants to understand the customers better, and she's been inspired by hearing all of these great stories about companies using social media to, uh, to, to generate business. And, and there are some pretty tremendous ones, uh, so that she, she has a point, of course. Um, she, she knows that they are sort of, they're very cost driven, they cost away. They think like they want to run this. They're like Ikea Ingvar Kamprad. If you know the Ikea founder Ingvar Kamprad, he never travels first class. One guy at Ikea was trying to get home from a meeting somewhere in Europe and they were out of, they were out of um, like basically couch class plane tickets. He said, I have to fly first class, there are no coach class. And they, <coughs> the instructor said, no, we never fly coach. No, so we never fly first class. You're taking a taxi home. He went on a taxi from somewhere in, 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 in Europe to Sweden. Guess what was cheaper, but that was the principle. <laughs> and they're sticking to it. So she says, let's keep this in the smallest budget possible, because if it doesn't work out, at least we didn't waste so much money on it. And she has a look at the competition, the, the Widget Co's competitors. And uh, she checks with this in-house guy, Mark, who does all the procurement for IT and hardware. And, uh, and they look for, at them for the ideas. And people at the company get to hear about the project, send ideas to the market, you should have this, you should have that. Oh, I love that. Oh, that. oh you know what my wife, wife told me the other day? Oh, you know what my husband likes? Like, they got a massive pile of documentation. And uh, Susan thinks it's cool. Wow, there's a lot of good ideas in here. Mark is like, Mark is the engineer. He's like, this is too unstructured. This is never going to work. Um, and, and they mix it. They mix design, and they mix fonts, and they mix, they mix colors, and they mix structural changes, and, and, and everything, high and low. But so says, you know, the agencies, they know this kind of stuff. They're used to dealing with requirements. They, they, they understand how to pick the brains of people like us, so just, just they'll deal with it. But they also ask a freelance sign to make a mock-up, a beautiful Photoshop mock-up. You know exactly what I mean, uh, to send out, to make absolutely clear what you want in this age. And the agents start calling. They, they, because um, because this is not clear at all. And uh, and a lot of it is ambiguous. And the bids start coming in, and they're even harder to compare. So, seeing as Susan and, and Mark they don't have any formal training in, in comparing bids or, or doing a bidding process, what they end up is doing they look for the lowest price. That's the easiest one. Which agency is the is the one that expects this this payment? So they pick one, and uh, this agency is not, they're not exactly, they're, they're not actually, the bid is not as low as they hope to be, but if they lower it by 10%, they can fit in the budget. They said, look, you guys get to do a, you guys get to do a case about us, and it, about this project, and in turn, can you give us a discount? And they're like, fine. It's a young agency, they want to prove themselves, so they agreed to it. They think this could be a great case that could lead to more business later. Um, so, next thing they do, they set up some really clear milestones here. 
Susan, sorry, that planning, having a great plan is a, is, is a key to a successful project. So they look, at, they look at what they need to deliver and who needs to test it. And they also check the vacation time zone in the company. So they tie everything down to what suits widget co. And they also add a penalty clause. So in case they don't deliver on time, they can have to pay for it. So let's make it really clear who's boss. Um, things seem to go well initially. And, but there's a lot of questions. And Susan and Mark cannot answer those questions. When the company, when the agency comes to them and says, how should we do this? Mark and Susan have no idea. And the people that are supposed to know, they're nowhere to be found. They're out of the building for some reason. The team works day and night. Uh, and the agency is getting really fed up with all this ambiguities and, and the changes they imply because they took on this project on a very small budget and very tight limits. So they're like, no, no changes. We're sticking to what says that even those ambiguous, we're going to interpret it in the best way possible for us because we don't want to run in the red. <coughs> they see this project growing and growing. They eventually finish. Uh, and on time, actually, but the team is exhausted. They work day and night, and the, the, the technical project manager from the agency has gone on medical leave. So six months later, it's time for the executive team at Widget Co. to meet again and see if their new website is actually paying off. Mark is dressed up in a suit. He never wears a suit, but this time it's a big day. He's written out tons of nice graphs and reports from Google Analytics and, and so on, their CRM system, to get the hard numbers. But there is no hockey stick. All the time, effort, and money had no effect whatsoever. We're back to square one. <coughs> so was this project a success? Well, we can tell up the score and have a look. Requirements were fulfilled to the letter. That's true. But at the same time, the team worked their ass off. The seller made a loss, and the buyer did not see the results they were hoping for. Do you recognize this kind of case? OK, I see no hands, but I, <laughs> I assume you do. All right. So how do we end up here? Uh, well, as I see it, there are five important phases of a project. It's a needs phase, a requirements, a sign phase, a bidding phase, execution, and evaluation at the end. Uh, and I think there are some things that we often do wrong or forget to do in these phases. The needs phase, we don't talk about the business goals. So the project becomes cost driven. Since you don't talk about what you can gain from it, it can't possibly be an investment. And if you're a smart business person, you want to minimize cost and maximize revenue. So and I think a lot of these projects are driven by a cost mindset. Secondly, it's hard for the team to deliver what the customer wants since they're not aware of the business goals. So they can't choose a better solution when they have to. Requirements. Requirements were of mixed quality, focused on the superficial. They weren't relevant to the business goals. They asked for things that had nothing to do with what they actually would expect the site to achieve in the end. The bidding, the bidding ended up, well, they didn't have an experience in bidding. So what happened was that they just focused on price and not the, the agency's ability to perform the project. And, and the agency had to rely on software estimation, which for a long time was my sort of trademark in the Drupal community which I think is a horrible place to start. But when I was talking about that, it was because that was the seat many of us were in as Drupal agencies. And I think it's not a good place to be, which is why I'm talking about this right now. Execution. They designed a way to feel secure as a buyer. Given the little knowledge they had, they tried to fit themselves in a position where they felt as secure as possible, protected from everything by strict deadlines, penalty clauses, and so on. Uh, it killed motivation in the team. And it, I'm going to move my mic. And the inflexible execution prevented the project from gaining from ongoing learning. I'm going to go back to what I mean by ongoing learning, but I think you'll, you'll know what I mean when I mention it. Finally, the team did not know how the project would be valued and what the buyer, the final buyer, the economic buyer expected to see. This is not a rare case. Uh, this happens. At, 20, at, at, at companies that aren't among the top 25% technology, Three out of 10 IT projects fail on average. And, and why did they fail? Well, these are the common causes. Lack of user input involvement. They didn't do any user research in our case, for example, at the widget code. 
the requirements were incomplete. They didn't do systematic collection requirements. They didn't link the requirements to business goals. And there was no age involvement when the requirements were written. So they could not benefit from the experience that the agency could offer them. And the expectations were unrealistic. The expectations and the goals were not communicated and shared. And the budget was not set in relation to the expectations either. There were two separate things. Try to keep the cost down and then expect to have a, a goal plated Ferrari. Even the, even the successful ones, the people who are successful, they're still, they're over budget, over time, and effective and function upon completion. I mean, you still have bugs, which may not be possible to completely eradicate, but you know, we can at least avoid bugs in the, in the business critical functionality. So is this sustainable for us, for you, for your customers, for our entire business? Of course not. Like the IT, IT, IT has a bad name because of this. So what if we inverted this scoreboard? The team worked at an effective pace, the seller made a profit, and the buyer saw the results they were hoping for. But the requirements would not be fulfilled to the letter. What would that be like? Would that be, would that be a bad thing? I don't think so. I think this would be the ideal scenario. <clears throat> so we need to change how we view project. And I, I propose a, a fourfold change. First of all, focus on results. Secondly, Talk about measurable success. Three, view the project as an investment. And finally, understand that project involves learning and discovery. The project is not written, it's not, it's not, it's, it's not written in stone what it should do and how it should work. What happens if you do this? Well, this is what I see happening. I see trust. Trust between the buyer and trust between the seller. I see mutual gain. The buyer gets the value they want, the seller gets actually the, make, the, makes a profit, and they will be financially secure. There's mutual respect, there's no distrust of each other, and they feel like they're part of something big, there's something meaningful, higher purpose of what they're doing, and they're proud of what they've done. You saw the questions I asked earlier? The questions which so many of you I didn't raise your hands to. If you did it this way, what I'm going to propose, more of you might actually raise your hands when I ask those questions. So what would it be like? Well, the business goals would be communicated from day one. The project would be based on how much, how much value they hope to generate, not trying to minimize, minimize it as a cost, because they, the, they, see, they see what they can achieve using this technology. Requirements would be at the right level. Um, and they would be supported by strategic analysis and not by, and not by some sort of ad hoc method. Um, Bidding by looking for the lowest price would be replaced by finding someone who can do the best job possible. And um, they, they, you spend time actually trying to find the right agency. And you involve the agency in the process more actively. And a software estimates work as planning the first phase. You plan the first phase to see what can we potentially do. And then you work from that to have a bit of an idea. And then you, you constantly reevaluate. Uh, learning, I think, is a key takeaway here. And so is um, the, the communication, which establishes trust, and continued delivery, which also is a trust factor. If you tell the customer, we have this done by Thursday, then they'll start trusting you. If you keep doing that, keep delivering those Thursdays, it's, if you tell them, this, will, this site will be done in three months, and you don't deliver, that's a massive failure of trust. Because you promise something you cannot keep. So small promises, small victories. Um, evaluation. People know what the site is built, but they know what the customer expects to happen, they expect to see in terms of raw numbers. And um, everyone knows what their goals are and what's trying to achieve. So too good to be true, eh? So where do these ideas come from? What is, this, what is, what is, what is Lunatic talking about? 
And um, well, they come from two things. Agile, which I'm sure all of you here are familiar with, and two methods called impact mapping and effect mapping. Uh, Agile methods come in many flavors. I'm sure all of us, all of you work with Scrum, right? Anyone here doesn't use Scrum? No. No, I didn't expect that. Um, but it comes in a, Agile comes in other forms like FTD, XP, Kanban, these things. Some, some custom projects, some are like just ways of working. And it all began sometime around 1991. And they have branched out ever since. The, la the, latest, uh, the latest form of Agile working is, is the Lean Startup, which implements parts of Scrum and, of course, DevOps. And it's, it's a way, of, it's, it's a way, it's, and, and, and I think this, this holistic, this, uh, this uh, short wind approach is, is been remarkably successful. Does it work? Yes, they work. Lower cost and improvements in revenue quality and cycle time. You get more for less. And, and a long, a long term study the, by the Standish Group shows that Agile products are three times more successful than waterfall products. And they were looking at 10 years of data. So why is it so? Well, uh, what most people think is that projects are, when you do IT, you know all the answers. Like, you know, you, you, know, you guys are experts. You're like, you know exactly. You, you solved these problems before. The fact is, we usually haven't. It's not simple. It's not close to certain, not close to agreement. We usually end up somewhere here. Waterfall methods are perfect when you know exactly what you're doing. I'm sure there could be a perfect case for waterfall methods. Uh, but as we go closer to uncertainty, Agile becomes more and more suitable. Technologies and requirements are partially unknown. And just because someone says they want a certain thing doesn't mean that you can persistently predict the, the implications of that. <clears throat> I, think, I think Agile is, is, is more suitable when you do Drupal work. Here's a new thing for many of you, I think. Impact mapping. Impact mapping is a way to link business goals to what you build. Uh, <clears throat> they help you do strategic planning. They help you learn as you deliver and apply that learning. Help you build roadmaps and help you make a scope that you can change in which gives you like a helicopter view of where you're going in the project. Impact maps basically answer why are we doing it, who are we doing it for, how do we do it for them, and what do they need? What do they need in order to help us achieve what we're trying to do? Uh, in the words of the man who gave it the name Impact Maps, Koiko Adzic, it's a visualization of scope and underlying assumptions to create a collaborative by senior technical business people. And this is the interesting thing. You can put programmers and the guys in suits and women in suits in the same room, and they can talk to each other, and they will understand each other. They're going to talk about the business goals, and your developers are going to understand what the deliverables are. They're going to understand why you need a certain feature in order to achieve a certain business goal. Effect maps are similar. In fact, is impact maps were actually, when Gorka Artich discovered effect maps, he saw we can use this for higher level planning too. So he took those and adapted them for scrum planning. But these are more focused on how should the user design be done? How should, it, how, how, how should the user experience be in order to deliver these business goals? Uh, so these are based on user research and they help you interaction design. These are help, these are based, these are, these are done in a strategic meeting. They're less data driven, uh, but they help, they help you focus on the right thing to deliver the business value you're hoping to see. So I usually, what I do, I usually explain it this way. So using uh, an effect map, and what you know about the users and need, you can write personas and which help you do usability testing using a prototype with the features they want. But using the, the, the impact map, you can actually define smart measurable goals. You can, uh, you can, you can define who you're, who you're trying to target, like the user, what, how they can contribute and what features they need. And then you can test those, you can build those and see, do they actually have the impact? No, they don't. Then you can go back and, and reevaluate re your your assumptions. And those of you who are familiar with the Lean Startup, anyone here familiar with the Lean Startup? All right. You know the build, measure, learn cycle that Eric Ries talks about the whole time. It's like you build something, you put it out there, you try and use what they learn from that to make it even better. 
you get it built in here. It's all part of the impact map. You can use the impact map to plan and drive your build measure learn cycle. Well, just in case you're not convinced, here comes some, some uh, counter arguments. And um, well, without price bidding, sellers have no incentive to be cost effective. Well, price must be effective, but it must stand in relation to, to the effective impact generated. Otherwise, you have the cost driven perspective. Uh, and and if, if people think they can get a low price at no cost, they must be silly, you know? Like, you know, you get what you pay for. So I think it's also a matter of also educating our customers what they're buying if they go with us or go with someone else. But the buyer needs to have clear milestones, otherwise, the project will fail. Yeah. Um, and that, that is true. But the milestones should be tied to actually what you want to achieve and not, not a speculation. Otherwise, it's just become a paper product if you do them too early on. And you need to have buy in the, you need to have total buy in, 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 in milestones. You can't just set them centrally and say, this is what you guys have to adhere to. And knowledge is gained during the course of project, and those need to be reflected in the milestones. Uh, but customers don't know their business needs and goals. And that's true. And that's something I'm going to show you how you can solve, how you can address this with asking the right questions. And they don't necessarily need to have a business problem opportunity either. For this to for this to work for them, sometimes sometimes you, you meet someone who have a have a feeling of something, and then you can help them actually address the problem or help them be proactive. So things can be done very differently, and uh, let's look at the the second universe, where widget code, the parallel universe, a widget code also exists, and it's a much better story this time. Um, and same thing again, Susan is here. Um, we have the same problem as before, the, the traffic to the e-commerce site. But Susan, Susan has a bit of, this version of Susan, she knows a bit more of, of how she wants the project to proceed. So she defines the goals. And uh, they set the budget based on the earnings they will make if they reach those goals. And the goals are very clear. They want 40% more traffic to the website than they currently have. They want 10% higher conversion rate on website visitors. And, and they want to have 10% conversion rate on those that go to the e-commerce site to become, become customers to actually buy. And they want to see this done in six months. So they have a time frame and they have specific, specific measurable goals. Uh, Mark, he's the nerd again. He, uh, he helps them sort out um, the, 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 the few requirements they actually have this time. And uh, they try to keep them high level. You know that they're not experts in this. So they know that they need to get the information they need. Um, so they want to learn more about the end users. So they hire an agency, actually a user research agency, to talk more about the end users. The people in the company will be using the site and the customers they want to affect. They make wireframes, high level wireframes. No, no detailed Photoshop mockups this time, just high level wireframes to capture the most important concepts. And um, by now, they feel they have a basic understanding. Uh, they know they will learn a lot over the course of this project. And they're confident with doing just upfront planning. They know that they think plans, plans are nothing. Planning is everything. Or you know the saying by, which you could, the basic quote to every famous general ever, like plans, plans survive until you meet the enemy. Sort of something along those lines. And they know this. So what they do now is they create a presentation. They create a presentation and they send it out, like a PSH file, send it out to the agency and says, look, this is what we're trying to do. They're super, they're super, they're super open about what they're trying to achieve, what money they hope to, hope, hope to make and so on. And in, re in return, they want the agency to pitch how they will do the project. They're being open about budget, being open about, about, about what they know so far and what they think they don't know. And three agencies respond and they, they have some really interesting meetings. The agents bring up some aspects and ideas that they were not aware of in this conversation they're having. It's a mutual learning conversation. And they pick one based on their fitness, Pers personal chemistry, how well they can get along, their background and so on, and how they seem to understand the scope and whether they have the right approach to it. The price is just a factor out of many. They know that the price is not what they were going to spend in the project long term anyway. And. Uh, the, the agency, they work with Agile, and they, they, they like working that way. The team is cross-functional, designers, developers sitting side by side. 
when I was, uh, there was a conference in Stockholm a few weeks ago called From Business to Buttons, and one speaker there, Jeff Gotthelf, who's written a book called Lean UX, he had a, uh, he had a session on innovative teams. And he's, he quoted Kent Beck, for like, you know him as the creator of XP. And Kent Beck says that the problem many people do is that they give teams a list of features to build. He said that's the wrong approach. You should give teams questions to answer. You take a team of a designer, a developer, and, a, and maybe, a, maybe a, a copywriter or someone and say, we have this problem. I give you two weeks to come up with an answer, giving your collective knowledge. Features, you, should not, you shouldn't have feature lists. You should have a list of questions you want answered. That's how, you make, that's how you get the most out of the, the really smart people you have hired. The team can turn directly to the customer. How many of you have heard this thing that the project manager should be the only one talking to the customer? Yeah, right? That's being taught you know, in project management courses. Like that is like this, as some sort of legal way to protect you from I don't know what. It's nonsense. Ignore it. That's, that's, that's utter BS. You know when you were in, you know when you were in kindergarten, you played this game with the kids. Like you stood in a row, and someone whispered one thing in the next person's ear, and then you asked the person then what they heard, like a chain of whisper. Yeah, was it ever the, the same thing that came out? The person said that they actually heard in the end of the link. Exactly. So why do we why do we run our communication in, in, in projects this way? It doesn't work. And even if you use written email and so on, there's so much email and communication that is misinterpreted and so on. Because it depends on who is saying it and how is saying it. I mean, the number that I hear floating around is that 80% of communication has to do with how we move and how we talk, not what we say. So bring them closer together. And they start this yeah, uniquely. They start with a kickoff. And Susan is kind of enthusiastic, as you can see. Um, and uh, it's just a remark, they love what they're doing. The team, the, team, the team really feel this enthusiasm. I have a customer now, and, and, and we're working with him. And, and what's so funny is that since we can be very open about how we work, I can see his enthusiasm what it does, and I can share my enthusiasm. We have, a, we, have a joint, we have a joint goal of solving his business problems or creating opportunities for him. And that's something, that, that, that's super exciting when you can have that, when we can have that kind of buy-in. Uh, so, so the next step to do, they, they talk about roles. They talk about expectations and so on. To avoid misunderstandings and to make sure that people know what's expected of them. And that's part of it. And together, this helps build trust. The, the initial planning work leads to a lot of backlog items. And the team makes an early like, ex estimate of what's hard and what's easy and so on. Um, and some things are left now, because they know that we, we can't possibly know what this means. And I made this mistake myself. I remember I was sitting on a, on a, on a Scrum project. It was supposed to be Scrum. And the customer said, yeah, um, we have this budget, and we have this much in the backlog. And I was like, yeah, let's estimate the backlog so we know how much left to do. Like, uh, you see the problem with that kind of reasoning? What I, what I later said, I did, I, did, I, did, I, did, I did waterfall by Scrum. Uh, essentially, you can't estimate a backlog with, with epic size backlog items three months in the future. That's, you're making the same mistake, but it, it's so alluring to think that. So me and, me and I, one of the best developers sat in this room for like three hours to estimate this backlog to give the customer uh, some kind of, be able to make some kind of promise. You can't do that. It's impossible. And that's the thing with, with Scrum is that there's a, there's, you have the horizon. There's like fog. And you can only see maybe 100 meters. And that's as far as you can plan. The rest is shrouded for you. And, 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 and that's how reality looks. And we can't change that fact. But we have to think of it when we do planning. But they didn't plan too far ahead. And they leave some things for later. And uh, when some things they say, let's time box them. Let's, let's discover. Let's go in to spend a week just trying to figure this thing out to see if there's a better way. In many cases, that turns out to be a better way. And, and Mark and Sue say, yeah, that's a great idea. We didn't think of that. That's going to take half as long. Let's do that instead. So by actually by being able to all to change, been able, having, having a, a, not being focusing on requirements, but on the goals, they can find a new path to get where they want to go. And, uh, but some things turn out to be more complex. And they can't build everything in the backlog, but they're fine with it. They identify five things that are, are, are critical, and they build those five things. And uh, the project, um, the project uh, is finished on time and so on, and they have a release party. 
About a week later, they discovered there's a bug in the registration process. The, user can't, the, the, the users can't sign in. And the agency is super quick. Even though the project's over, it's super quick to go in there and fix it. Because they know this is our baby. We worked so long to make this thing work, so we're not going to let this tiny little thing stop it. And, uh, and immediately, they meet the results of open for meeting six months, they meet in four months instead. Widgetco is super happy. They're like, wow, why didn't we do this before? This is, and they're actually planning the next, uh, the next phase of the project right now in the fictional universe. Um, so you have a stronger buyer-seller relationship. You have better use of money, higher success rate. You have higher satisfaction of all parties involved. So I'm asking you, what universe do you want to live in? All right. So let's get, let's get down to it. Let's get concrete here. What do we need to do to do this? Well, I propose a new dictionary. Don't talk to your customers about cost. I have, I have outlawed this word in all conversations with customers. I remember, so I told you guys that I was part of Fondly Node 1 some years ago. And I remember, I remember back in those days, I think I was going through some pile of papers and I found, found an old quote from like 2009. And we had something, overview of costs, it said. I mean, like, how stupid were we? Seriously. Like, why even say that kind of thing? But, you know, like, you get smarter, you get older, you get smarter. So please don't make that mistake, okay? It's pretty dumb. Uh, requirements. Don't focus on requirements, customer. When you meet them, talk about the results. You know what all the web businesses do? They focus so much on what their little baby, their piece of technology they're trying to build, and not so much about what, what that thing can help the customer do. Just like, uh, like, like Jam had been saying here earlier, what Drupal is about, what benefits does it bring them to build this thing? Talk about that. Don't talk about requirements. Be prepared for learning, or make the customer be prepared for learning. Say that we can figure everything out early on, but we need to allow room for learning. As long as you deliver on the results, does it matter if we actually do it exactly the way we plan? And encourage trust. Trust them. Give them the chance to trust you. Like I said, it's a fourfold change. It's um, we focus on the fact that the project is generating results. We are in agreement on how to measure and define success, reaching those results. We consider it to be an investment, not a cost. And we see it as a learning experience for all parties. So we start with goals. <clears throat> the customer says, we need a better website. I'm like, what does that mean? What you do is I ask one question. Guess which one? Well, the customer, uh, uh, yeah, but, yeah well, what question would you ask if they, we need a better website? You would ask? <coughs> oh, it's just one word. <laughs> it's just one word. Why? Exactly. You ask why. You ask why. And what do they say then? It's really hard to find who we are, and there's no way to post comments and fill them up. And then you're like, but why is that a problem? A big share of customers want to feel involved. And? Why, why, why is that relevant? Bam! We need to reach that customer in order to channel more sales to the website. They want more sales to their website. That's what they want. This is where the money is. See all the glittering dollar and pound signs and everything? Kapow! That's what we want. All right. Let's, 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 uh, let's do this a bit of structure. Okay, so what are we right now? Right now, we're seeing 3,000. 3,000 something. It could be 3,000 orders or 3,000 uh, people that actually convert into customers at the website. We want to see at least 5,000 to break even, to make this investment pay off that we do with the project. But the target is to reach 7,000. So we structured it like this. If this is our first milestone. Then we set a time. In six months, we want to be here in six months. But we can also tolerate some operational costs. It's going to cost some time to set up. Maybe we have to get new infrastructure. We're going to have to pay you guys for building these for us. So we can tolerate some, some costs for a while, as long as we can maintain these. <clears throat> and, uh, and then we want to go back to it. Then we want to, then we want to go back to the old cost. Once we the project, we want the cost to be that's what it used to be. So when you've done this, then you can ask this question. What are these results worth to you? 
the project is an investment. The customer can say, let me think about that. The answer to that question determines the budget. They see immediately the return they're going to get out of this. So they can bring the investment perspective up on the table immediately. And <clears throat> I'm experimenting and trying out different ways to work in value-based consulting with my customers. No time billing. It's more about focusing on the, the value we create. So if you're curious about that, you know, we can meet up for a beer or something or a coffee later or just meet here and talk a bit more about what your experience are or what your thoughts are because I think it's super exciting because I want to get out of the hourly, the hourly billing you know, swamp. Um, so the results here is an impact map. We have the measurable goal, 7,000 orders per month. Who do we need to involve? Who can help us get there? Those are our customers. What do we need them to do? Place orders. Okay, how do we help them place more orders? Are there anyone else? Are there, more, are there more things they can do? Do they know someone who can help us? Could they invite their friends maybe? Yeah, they could. They can invite their friends and they could become repeat customers. Huh, they can actually add more value. Well, we can actually motivate them to add more value. And what can the customers do then? Well, they can then place orders and they can tell friends. Okay, these are, these are impacts. These are things they can potentially do for us. But they need something for us to do that. They need features. Aha, these are the most important ones. These are the ones we, we want. Because well, when we have a view of uh, what the customers want, then we can actually take an opinion of how much, would, how much time will it take to implement. Is it worth doing? Is it lower high hanging fruit? Now we can do this analysis. And then we can look at, OK, what features do we want for that? Well, product recommendations, implementing Facebook like share. And this is, this is, this is can be applied in, in a pretty wide context. I talked about someone the other week about, or two weeks ago, about what my company does. And he says, oh, so you only work with digital companies? And I had this fictional example of a cafe. Imagine you open a cafe, and you're like, oh, totally eco-friendly cafe. And you, a, lot of, a lot of the customers who come there, they hang out to people at the same values. And you come up with this idea that when you go to the cafe, you can't, if you pay with your phone, order with your phone instead of at the bar, you get a 10% discount. So a lot of people, they start placing the orders on their phone. And then, they, and then they, and they, they enter the table number, and the people serve to the table. It might seem like a really idiotic way, because like you, you lose the human interaction. But here comes, here, comes the, here comes the fun part. 30 minutes after you leave the cafe, you get a pop-up on your phone. It says, did you like your latte? Well, you know, you can, you can give a discount code to your friends on Facebook, and they get a 20% discount. And you get one for free. What do you say? So by tying these digital links to people, you can market in, in a whole different way, regardless of the business you're in. And this is a low-hanging fruit that could come out of this, because this map does not only talk about the website. It talks about your partners, like advertisers and so on. It's a high-level system to find new ways to advertise your business. They visualize deliverables and assumptions. The, the beautiful thing about this business map, is the, uh, this impact map, is that you can share this one. You can sit in a room with a buyer, with the economic buyer, and with the developers, and they all understand exactly where things fit in here. The developers can weigh in on the feasibility and the complexity, and the, and the economic buyers, they can weigh in on how much is it worth them in terms of, in terms of investment and so on, and how it fits in there strategically. This approach also allows us to, to learn. We can look after two milestones to see, have we, see, have we seen the impact we're hoping for? Are we seeing 7,000? Our key target, 7,000. If we're not, then one of our assumptions are wrong, and we need to go back and reconsider those. So next time you're starting a project, you should ask the customer, why do you want to invest in this project? They will tell you the goals, the milestones, investments, results. That's key information. You need to ask, who do you want to involve? Who do you want to engage? That will see your actors, your personas, the users that you want to be more active on the website. How will actors, actions contribute to the goal? Then you see the impact, how they can contribute, invite their friends, place more orders. And finally, what will the actors do to create the impact? Will they place more orders, invite friends, do a share? Do they, what do they need concretely? Like, I want to invite friends, but you can do it 10 different ways. This will tell you concretely what function you need. And if you're going to read more, there are two books I recommend, Impact Mapping by Gorka Atsic, and you can find it on impactmapping.org. And, um, and the other book is Specification by Example, which uh, presents a really great way to write better user stories for Agile. Um, and you can also go to my website for some more links and, and downloads if you want to see more. 
So thank you, and good luck in the next project. You have to tell me. your uh, presentation? Yeah? You can ask two questions. Do you want me to ask two questions to the audience? So if there's someone who has questions. Oh, I see. Okay. So people that ask questions get t-shirts, apparently. All right. I think it's for the, I think it's for recording purposes. So I got, um, I got two questions. First is, um, how do you get, because in your example, you started from the case where, you, um, where the client already has decided to follow this principle, right? Like the client has to upfront decide that they want to do it that way. Yeah. Um, and um, so how do you do it in, the real, in real life where clients don't know how to do it that way? And they're actually normally um, just starting with specification. Do you go in and say like, okay, I think you're totally wrong and here's a process that's gonna work better? Or how do you do that? Well, what I would do is I would probably, um, I would start with a small project, more classically done, and I would use that as opportunity to, to, to work them, to get them more come over to your side instead. Because they will understand, first of all, they need to have trust, they need to trust you. And that's not something that happens overnight. Unless you yeah. have really great uh, references or they know someone who can vouch for you, then you need to win that trust. Right. And that's one way to do it, to do a small thing that way, and then you can convert them into a... Right, and, and uh, the second question, um, crap. Uh, <laughs> uh, Two t-shirts for you. <laughs> no, um, you, you can give it to somebody else. Um, it's not coming, it's gone, I think. Um, so, the process and, oh yeah, the second question. Um, like this sounds like a really cool process, but how does it work in like bigger scale? So like what we typically do is um, university figures out they need a new website. And it's like they got, I don't know how many humongous amounts of departments and they all have their own ideas. And so your process sounds really, really interesting for like small improvements, kind of like tangible one step further things, but it sounds harder to use it to like bootstrap a whole new platform and then like make a really big um, uh, significant jump. So like it, it sounds like a great way to evolutionary uh, build uh, something and to uh, keep on improving it. But I think it's much harder to use it or I, I believe or I think or I feel um, looking at what you presented um, that it might be a problem when you have like, okay, we're starting from scratch and we need to build this system that does all these things. Um, do, you, do you have an idea about that or, or how would you approach that? I would start by, by interviewing the stakeholders. Not to collect requirements, but like, because I think if you, if, if you listen to everyone, everyone's gonna have an opinion. But to filter that through someone. Like I would work with a user research agency or someone like that who can filter them out. With what are the needs? Customers, they, don't usually, they can't just tell you what they need. You need to ask them, you need to understand, their, basically, if you say, you know the, you know the old, the saying that they, that they attribute to Henry Ford, like if you ask people to want, they would say faster horses. Mm -hmm. Like you don't want faster horses. And I would, I would do that through a grad, I would first do that work su sufficiently enough, and then I would do it in small steps. You have to start somewhere. But, but it sounds like, like most of the projects that I've seen, they've done that work on their own, yeah. or at least they think they have. Um, and then, so basically most customers are like, oh, we've already done all that, now here's a spec. Uh, I've I think, seen that too, yeah. yeah. So, so do you have a way to... to yeah, but do they understand, do, but can they answer these questions, like, like yeah. what they're trying to achieve? Like do they have any metrics on what they're right. trying to achieve? Right, that's a good question. Yeah, but well, it's, it's and interesting. And if you have the metrics, and then in the end yeah. complain the project, not what they, what, we met the metrics you asked for. I, what, what I was thinking while you were talking was that um, it might be an interesting method to kind of go to a customer and try to increase their budget. Because often they'll say like, oh, we have, I don't know, we've had customers coming to us like, we've got 2,000 euros, and like, okay, that's gonna be hard, like, because you want the whole web shop. Yeah. <laughs> or like, we've got 1,400 euros, like, yeah. no, it's not gonna work. But, um, but I guess that uh, if you start like this, where you say like, so what is it really that you want to reach? And what are the monetary goals? Then you might be able to say like, okay, but you know, the real value is much yeah. larger. 
Uh, so like, can, like, we have some ideas to even increase the value beyond what you originally thought. Yeah. So maybe, maybe, you know, maybe we can increase the budget. So that, that's, that's an interesting technique. That's why ideas want to work. You want to yeah. make the customer, you, you want to you open up their eyes and yeah. be able to make even more value. Because if, if you are, if you're truly valuable as a consultant, then you'll be in a place with your advice and your experience, your perspective, help them make decisions that really like a, like a, like a, like a, Turn, yeah. like a turnkey thing. Like it, it totally transforms what they do. And it will change the perspective on, on what's possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. More questions? Well, well I, I actually, I have, a, I have a question then. Uh, the whole process of defining what value uh, is the project supposed to bring and going through the whole process of you know, persuading the client to actually look at a value-based uh, approach and all. This takes a lot of time. Like, it's, if you just go to them and ask them, what do you want to achieve? They're usually like, hmm, we have to think about it and all. You know, it, only in a small website or in a smaller organization, there would be one person who would just quickly say, we want this. And usually this whole thing would actually take time. And so before you actually come to a moment where you know what the budget is supposed to really be and all, you do a lot of work. So how would you usually, you know, make a return on that? Especially that probably you would go through all these stages and suddenly at the end, the client would say, yeah, it's too expensive anyway, so I'm just gonna have to think of something else. It's not expensive if you can see the return on it. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like you're, gonna, you're gonna pay 10,000, I'm gonna help you make like 150,000. How can you see that expensive? I know, but you know, <laughs> from the client's perspective, he's but gonna talk so, all, all this through with yeah, you, and then he's expensive. gonna say, yeah. But the problem they have then is they have a problem to actually produce that money. Then you can set up a payment term so they can pay more later. You can always find a way, if they, if they think it's worth the money, then how they pay is a later issue. Yeah, but you know, the whole work that you do up to this very point that may take, you know, okay. X amount of days to actually do that. And then how do you get return on, the, on these days before you even, you know, agree on a budget or anything? Because, you know, usually you would have to go through many, many steps before you even start working, uh, comparing to a s other approach where you just, you know, get a spec, uh, you know, a design and you just do the website or whatever. Then you, you, you can, you know, you, you, you make an estimate and you just earn money. But if you go through this whole phase, the whole, you know, phase up to the, when we start actually working is also work and it's even more intangible. Like, so I think in, or, in order to sell this effectively, you need to have a number of things. First of all, the customer needs to trust you. You can't just be nobody, which is hard for us because we, we don't have a name yet, Leancep. But we're getting there and we're doing a lot of referral sales. People said, these guys are helping, they've done a tremendous job. I think, I think you can't afford to have unhappy customers. I know that firsthand. You can't have unhappy customer debt. Secondly, you gotta sell the right thing for them. And if you, if you qualify your customers enough in your sales process, then you will be selling the right thing. Thirdly, the right time. Well, timing can always be a problem, but, but you, know, like you can't do anything about it. But timing is right, you sell the right thing, and the price is not an issue. If, if they know that what they're gonna buy from you then it's just the money for the money for them producing the money. So I think I think my answer to you is that do your marketing, do your communication, do your sales. Basically, qualify the customer so far. And I know that a lot of not a lot of customers think like this. So it's an uphill battle so far, but it's going to be more and more common as customers see the benefit of working this way. They get more value and have a better longer longer term relationship with their with their agencies. Less stress. Thank you. I hope, uh, maybe not a perfect answer, but I agree. It's a yeah, lot no, of work, I understand but, it. Yeah, it makes perfect sense, I think. In the end, this, this is more fun, isn't it, than, than working the old way? Yeah. I think everyone is, is, is super hungry, so it's, it's okay <laughs> if you want to go eat. Does, uh, does anyone want my t-shirt? <laughs> I'll give you that, like. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. So let's do like a competition. If you can ask the audience a question about your presentation and <laughs> the person who answers gets the t-shirt. My, my wife told me to start taking less t-shirts. <laughs> okay, like, how many of you are gonna, are gonna try this thing in your next project? Uh, cool, all right. Two out of four out of, okay. <laughs>
50 people. Well, this is person, the person who raised hand the most. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I think one of you should try it. It's, it, it, it's totally worth it, even if just borrow ideas. It's going to transform my work with customers. All right. Thank you so much.